So thank you, Ron. Thank you, Vincent. Um, and thank you for having invited me to speak here and for your interest in Robolo. Um, Robolo uh, is a research um, uh, project financed by uh, the European Commission in order to come up with ideas on how to regulate robotic technologies. And um, our project main outcome will be to come up with uh, some guidelines for the regulation of uh, robotic technologies for the European Commission, and that is due spring 2014. I personally deal with liability rules, which are quite relevant um, in various forms. Um, liability rules um, expose, say, who is going to pay for the damages. And as a consequence of that, they provide an ex-ante incentive on how you should behave and um, how you should behave in terms of um, uh, 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 handling yourself in society as well as how you should behave when conceiving and designing a robot. So uh, there are normally uh, two different uh, criteria for ascribing liability, which one, one is uh, for uh, liability for the acts of persons. So a person is held liable because he knows what he's doing and he's uh, aware of his actions. And, um, and he's also held liable from a private law perspective, which is the one I'm interested in, because he has, uh, has assets with which to pay damages. Um, liability for damages involving things instead um, has to find the human behind it because basically the thing doesn't own, uh, first of all, doesn't have an intention normally and the thing doesn't, um, um, doesn't uh, have a wealth, uh, it doesn't have assets to, with which to pay damages. So you have to find someone behind the machine in order to make him liable and normally you either resort to the producer if the product is deemed defective, and defectiveness of a product um, in a, from a legal perspective can also be understood as not conceiving sufficient safeties or like not foreseeing how the uh, product may have been used. So for instance, a chair is meant to sit on it, but it's also known that people use a chair to stand upon it to reach things that are high. Um, so uh, this, if, if, if I built a chair that wouldn't uh, hold an, the weight of a normal person, uh, standing on top of it, probably I would be held liable for my design. And otherwise, owners or users for the misuse or the failed supervision. Uh, uh, failed su fail supervision is normally uh, um, related to animals or um, in some cases to children. Um, so, liability and robots. Uh, what is claimed, uh, what is frequently claimed is that robots are different uh, from any other thing because they are autonomous or and, and or have the ability to learn. And therefore, uh, new liability rules are uh, required, uh, some people say, in order to address those new technologies that are coming to our society. And um, some even push the thing a little bit further and say that robots themselves should be held liable for the damage they cause. Now, this can be understood in two different ways. Either you hold the robots liable because you deem them to be subjects and not any more objects, uh, or otherwise you hold robots liable as you would hold a corporation liable. Um, and that would produce just an effect of capping liability because, you know, like a corporation is a, is a person, is a legal person that operates in, in, in society and I put some money into the corporation so that the business I enter into puts that money at risk but I don't put my personal wealth at risk that way if I operate through the corporation. And a robot could be understood uh, as a, a legal person in this sense. But many think instead that robots should be conceived as a subject and not anymore an object. At least robots that show a high degree of autonomy or have some abilities to learn. I will tell you later why I think this makes no, not much sense. Um, so what are the issues? Uh, first of all, if we want to regulate robotics, we have to understand whether robots can be addressed unitarily or uh, if there are some relevant differences that we cannot overlook. And at the same time, um, we have to ask ourselves whether a specific uh, technical aspects suffice in justifying a change in perspective for the description of liability. That meaning, uh, is it sufficient to say that the robot is autonomous to say that then we need a, a particular set of rules uh, to address its, the, the damages that might be caused by the robot? So um, the thing is that the very notion of robot is atechnical and doesn't say much about what a robot is. Um, if we uh, happen to take a definition from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says that it's a machine that looks like a human being. And then what about robots that work in a factory and performs various complex acts? And, and, and a Roomba is also a robot and it's a very dumb job that it does. And uh, that show lack of capacity for human emotions. And th this, is, uh, this is, of course, uh, just from 
uh, a film, but um, there are robots that are uh, conceived or researched in order to uh, uh, stimulate human emotions, to take power into, example, uh, into consideration as an example. And so um, there are actually robots that can show human emotions, can mimic human emotions, or should trigger human emotions. So th all these definitions are uh, really uh, carry no descriptive value. And um, so the idea being that there is not such a thing as a robot. And there are many different kind of robotic applications. There is a robotic prosthesis. There is a, a driverless vehicle. There is a drone. Um, there, uh, there is Da Vinci for uh, undergoing operations. There is Watson. So, and all these kind of robotic applications have very little in common. And it's, uh, it would be misleading to treat them unitarily. So the first conclusion is, since there is not a single notion of robot, um, robotic applications cannot be addressed unitarily, and they cannot be addressed unitarily even from a legal perspective. So you cannot think of the laws of robots, uh, not even from a private law perspective. And as a consequence, we really need to identify those distinctive, distinctive traits that justify a change in the analysis. And I'll go uh, uh, about talking about the, the, the the traits that are normally uh, identified as relevant. Uh, autonomy. There are at least two relevant notions of autonomy. Um, Gutmann uh, is a German philosopher. Uh, he published this paper in 2011, uh, distinguishing between strong autonomy and weak autonomy. A strong autonomy is philosophically defined as the um, uh, ability of the robot to exert free will. So uh, um, such robots clearly do not exist uh, today, um, and, and it's disputable from, and you, you probably know it better than I do, uh, if such kind of good old-fashioned AI could be created, or whether uh, it's way too complex to do. Um, and like uh, Gutmann also makes some philosophical arguments, I don't want to dive too much into the details in order to uh, explain why such kind of robots are not um, desirable, or it cannot be conceived actually from a philosophical perspective. Um, but pretty much if such a robot was created, um, then it would have to be treated as a subject because he would be deciding for himself what to do and what not to do. He would be setting its own goals and deciding uh, according to its moral rules. And uh, then it would switch from the realm of objects and become a, a subject. And like uh, 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 this uh, actually Greek uh, scholar uh, wrote, uh, they would become Träger von Rechten. Um, uh, caring rights, basically, and 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 um, but this we c can be considered as the limit, you know. And, and the paradox is that if robots were to be deemed subjects, well, we already have all sorts of law that could deal with their behavior. So we could just decide which kind of rights to grant them with respect to humans. We could use discrimination laws, but uh, in the end, we could treat them as uh, as beings, and therefore the law would know exactly how to deal with them. But this extreme case is not what should uh, uh, interest us, and we should keep it out off the table and use it as a limit. Everything up to that amounts to so-called weak autonomy. Um, this is the picture of a robot that was developed in Pisa. It's called Dust Boat. It's, um, uh, it's a small robot for the collection of garbage. It can drive around the city safely, avoiding collision with children, with passerbys, with bicycles, with cars. You would call it, and it would come to your home to collect the garbage from you. And um, it's not uh, overlooked or controlled. It, it does everything automatically from the moment it's called to the moment it picks up the garbage to the moment he drops it at the uh, waste deposit. And that would be an autonomous robot. And um, this uh, robot, um, <coughs> though, cannot be deemed a subject because it's just performing what it was built for, basically. Um, you are giving him an input, an order, which is go collect the rubbish, and he's doing whatever operation he needs to do in order to get his task completed. So he's basically responding to the situation it was originally programmed for. And he's not acting out of free will, and therefore it cannot be conceived as a subject and still becomes an object. A very sophisticated object, but still an object. Some uh, people claim that this leads to a loss of control. Uh, because the programmer, creator, some people call it creator, um, is, is not anymore in control on the single actions. And this gets more e extreme even with, uh, with the ability to learn, I will talk about later. But um, this uh, loss of control is actually only apparent because it's still the programmer and the producer or creator, call it as you wish, that uh, gave those capacities uh, and those features to the robot. And um, 
without uh, like those uh, actuators that he was provided with, the robot wouldn't be able to perform the tasks that he is performing. And therefore, but for the programmer, he is doing the things that he is doing. Um, and as I said already, weak autonomy we therefore doesn't allow us to consider the robot to become a subject. Then the ability to learn. There are so many different ways of conceiving the ability to learn. Um, uh, a very simple thing would be to download programs or updates from a cloud database or whatever it is. And uh, that doesn't involve a lot of thinking. Like it's, um, it's either a programmer or a producer who made the program specifically for the uh, robot. And then like he is clearly controlling what the robot is doing. And um, Otherwise, uh, much more complicated is in the interaction with the environment. There is an example of a, a learning elevator in a paper by, uh, by, by, by Matthias that says, basically, it's an elevator that is working, operating in a large, large, large building and is deciding on which floor to go, not up when it's cold, but upon like, uh, uh, the, 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 the history of usage that, that he recorded. Basically, he knows that at a given time of the day, a certain number of people go from floor X to floor Y, and he anticipates this and uh, moves accordingly. And uh, he makes the case that such an elevator like, uh, doesn't go to, because it gets it wrong because of an uh, um, unusual flow of passengers on some floors, then he fears that uh, there is always this unusual flow of passengers and leaves someone waiting on a floor for a really long amount of time. But this is actually a good example because, to show what I mean, because uh, that kind of a robot is performing one single task. And it's very simple for the producer to foretell that there might be outlayers, that uh, it might be that uh, in some cases there is a, a deviated flow of people, like because there is a conference on a floor for a day, so a, a greater number of people are moving from that floor to that other floor. But that doesn't mean that the, 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 the robot shouldn't be able to recognize the outlayer or even have a override common that allows someone else to send it actually to the re required floor at need in case of an emergency. And then there are the reinforced learning and the evolutionary robotic cases. Surely know about more than I do. But I've been doing some reading and um, my understanding is that evolutionary robotics is mainly used to identify the one individual that then has to be put onto the market more than letting the uh, uh, robot evolve uh, 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 over time after its release onto the market in its genetics. And reinforced learning is, a, 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 again, a different way of programming that requires a, a certain amount of training. And then that, that training becomes a part of the production because like, uh, like, a, like a, a walking dog for the blind um, is uh, not only born, but is also trained before it's sold to the blind person for the person to, to actually be able to use it. So uh, an equivalent dog would have to be created and then trained for it to know uh, how to uh, handle the, the blind person needing to walk. And so, uh, sorry? Okay, I'll be really quick. Um, so all these features are attributed to the, to the, uh, pr uh, to by the producer to the machine, and uh, therefore it was the producer's or designer's choice to allow the robot such kind of freedoms. Um, and, and therefore, even the ability to learn doesn't uh, justify a change in perspective. So this is my second conclusion. Only strong autonomy causes the robot to become a subject with rights and duties. Weak autonomy and the learning abilities do not suffice in this perspective. And the producer program is the one who is responsible uh, if the robot uh, is doing something wrong. Um, but we do not want to say at the same time that product liability rules fit in all cases and provide in all cases the right incentives. But the reason why they do not, uh, uh, do not satisfy us are based on other criteria <coughs> that are not purely technical, uh, but um, have to be found elsewhere. So we need to apply a technology by technology approach. So we cannot find the laws of robotics. We can find the laws applicable to specific kind of applications. And the, the, a, a different treatment should be grounded on policy considerations. I will give some very quick examples. Um, um, a robotic prosthesis is, a, 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 is probably a very limited market uh, because the number of people that may want to implant a robotic prosthesis are just few. And the potential risks for the developer of a robotic prosthesis are gigantic because the robotic prosthesis can be used in an unlimited uh, number of environments. And so we might want to provide an incentive. Also grounded on Article 4 of the UN Convention on the Rights <coughs> of Disabilities that was cited yesterday, 
by Professor Prescott. Um, so uh, we have to take into account policy considerations, and we also have to take into account the market for the given applications, and then we can elaborate any sort of viable alternative solution that I would be happy to discuss with you afterwards. So um, the real question when it comes to uh, the regulation of robotics and perspective of liability rules is where do we want to put the incentives and uh, what kind of uh, robotic technologies do we actually want to produce? Thank you. <laughs>